welcome to another Health Point program on Plasto Community Cable. Our program for this, for this evening is the number one killer of Americans, heart disease. My guest is Dr. Malik McCrowey. Thank you for being with us this evening. My pleasure. Dr. McCrowey is a graduate of the University of Algiers <coughs> Medical School in 1976. He did his internal medicine residency at the Framingham Union Hospital. He, is a he has a cardiology fellowship at the Brookline Hospital uh, in New York, and that's affiliated with the uh, Downstate University. He returned to Algeria as an assistant professor in medicine and cardiology, where he taught from 1986 until 1992. Dr. McCrowey has authored several publications on cardiology, hypertension, alcoholism, and cardiac disease. He is board certified in internal medicine in 1982 and in cardiology in 1985. He's also on the staff of the Plasto Medical Center. Welcome. Thank you, Davina. It's a pleasure being here. Glad to have you. And I hope uh, during this discussion we'll bring some answers to the questions that uh, people may have. I think that's <clears throat> our, our primary goal. There are, there are lots of questions out there, and our, our purpose this evening is to better inform our viewers. Um, why is it that cardiac disease is more common in Americans than other nationalities? Well, this is the feeling that people may have in general, but uh, I think the prevalence of coronary disease or heart disease in Western Europe is as much as in America. So it's not a peculiar feature of American people, and that's number one. Number two, uh, even in the immigrant population that come to the United States, they have as much prevalence of coronary disease as the American-born people. Although in their country, they may have lower incidence of uh, coronary disease, I think basically what it is is just a lifestyle mm -hmm. the American people have, which is completely different from the other people. Mm -hmm. So that immigrants, when they come to this country, they acquire American lifestyles, fast food and so forth, and also acquire, acquire the illnesses that go along with it. Exactly. Right. Is it true that it's more prevalent in men than in women? Well, it seems like women have some uh, protection from their estrogens. And uh, when we look at the epidemiologic f the statistics, uh, men have more chances of developing coronary disease early in life and uh, with a r ratio of probably 8 to 1 mm -hmm. before the woman reaches menopause. But after menopause, the women seem to catch up a little bit. And around the age of 70, the ratio is probably 1 to 1. Mm -hmm. And also what we can say now that we have evidence that using the estrogen in the postmenopausal uh, state will, retard, will delay the apparition of coronary disease or the, or the risk of cardiovascular disease. So it seems to be like estrogen may have some protection mm -hmm. in women as opposed to men. That's interesting. Uh, there are many other things that predispose an individual to coronary artery disease. Uh, can we talk a little bit about those? Well, basically, when we look at the what so-called risk factors in coronary artery disease, one can remember that there are some of the risk factors that are irreversible. We're born with it, and there's nothing we can do about it, such as the age. For example, mm -hmm. as we grow older, the, the I mean, it is natural to develop uh, atherosclerosis mm -hmm. wherever there is a vessel. That's one point. The second thing is the gender. As I mentioned before, men have more, the, uh, have more chance of developing earlier coronary disease than women because of this probably estrogen protection in women. And the third predisposing factor that's irreversible is the genetics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people that have familial hyperlipoproteinemia, for example, have a more chance of developing atherosclerosis earlier than other people. Mm -hmm. And other risk factors that are reversible, those are the ones we can, people have to work on, really, to try to decrease the incidence of coronary disease. And number one, of course, everybody knows it is smoking. Mm -hmm. You know, smoking is really detrimental to your health. Mm -hmm. And one should do as much as possible avoid smoking. That's one of the most prevalent risk of coronary artery disease. The second is hypertension. A high blood pressure. Uh, high blood pressure. <coughs> mm -hmm. And uh, one may double or triple the risk of developing coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disease by raising the diastolic blood pressure from 80 to 90, for example, or from 90 to 100. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
this is again one of the factors that should be reversible mm -hmm. by taking medication for example or doing other modification we'll get to that later on mm -hmm. and the third reversible f risk factor is diabetes mm -hmm. I mean although there's no cure to it but one may try to get uh, as much control in the blood sugar to try to avoid the development of mm -hmm. atherosclerotic heart disease or cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease and of course the fourth and major one that I think this is why you invited me <laughs> here is, is the high cholesterol levels. Right, that's a uh, major factor. That's a major factor. That's one thing. So uh, we'll, we'll save that to later on. Mm -hmm. And there are other risk factors that are still in the controversial part, you mm -hmm. know, like uh, the high triglyceride levels. Mm -hmm. uh, again, people agree and disagree about uh, whether high triglycerides level, level are indeed a risk factor or not. And I think, you know, a very high risk, a very high triglyceride level in itself may be a risk factor mm -hmm. because there's evidence now it decreases the HDL level. Mm -hmm. and, and also high triglyceride level are usually associated with other risk factors right. such as diabetes, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. So it may be also a risk factor. Obesity is also a question mark. Right. You know, and when we look at obesity <clears throat> per se, it's usually obese people have hypertension, they have also diabetes, and they may have also high cholesterol level. Mm -hmm. But this, nevertheless, obesity in itself is a health hazard. Mm -hmm. Because obese people also have a tendency to have what's so-called sleep apnea, like during the sleep at night, they stop breathing, and that on itself it's a it's major a health sure. hazard, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, again, uh, the type A personality, you know, mm -hmm. people that uh, have this tendency to work hard and always stressed. Right. And people have to learn, uh, should learn to relax a little relax bit. Relax and enjoy themselves uh, yeah. a little bit. We mentioned the HDL. You <clears throat> want to clarify the good cholesterol versus the bad cholesterol. One is HDL, the other is LDL. Yeah, well, well cholesterol is, uh, I mean, I should say, also this is also true Tri for triglycerides. Right. They cannot be present in the blood unless they mix to a protein, and the complex will cause uh, what will be called lipoprotein. And the, and the lipoproteins are differentiated according to their density, mm -hmm. one part, and number two, the size of the molecule, mm -hmm. and the component of fat that they're carrying. So, if you go from one density to another, for example, LDL, which is called the low density lipoprotein, is in major part made of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And it's the cholesterol that contributes to the formation of atherosclerosis, right. unfortunately. So that's the bad cholesterol. As opposed to the HDL cholesterol, which is a high density lipoprotein, which also contains mainly cholesterol. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, HDL in general is there to remove the cholesterol that's not used. So it is, in, a, in an essence, it is the good cholesterol. It's a good one, right. I think that's what people tend to hear about is the good versus the bad, yeah. and I think they, they don't always understand why, and I think that's important. This is why it, it is also important when you do the blood testing, you get a cholesterol level, if it's mm -hmm. high, to try to figure out which one it which is. Which one, right and uh, differentiate between the LDL and HDL. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some people have used ratios <coughs> and all that to try to differentiate and determine the risk of... The risk factor of yeah. having a problem. Exactly. Right. Uh, when we talk about coronary artery disease, we're talking about uh, cholesterol, plaque within the uh, arteries and so forth. We have a nice chart here of the heart. Maybe you can better describe exactly what coronary artery disease is by uh, using the diagram on that chart. Well, uh, the heart is uh, any organ in the body or any muscle needs blood supply to mm -hmm. be performing its duties, you know. And the way the blood gets to the heart is through what's so called the coronary vessel, coronary mm -hmm. arteries. This is a nice diagram here. You see the aorta, and this is the whole heart. And mm -hmm. you see the two major coronaries, the left and the right. Mm -hmm. and here there is another cut of the, the vessel on itself. This is a normal vessel. This is a nice 
Nice round, nice and clean. Nice and clean. And as the time goes on, you see the development of the first fatty streak that mm -hmm. deposit on the endothelium of the vessel, and then it progresses to a plaque, and then to a complicated plaque, mm -hmm. if it ever occurs. And that restricts the flow of the blood yeah. through the vessel so that... So, <clears throat> in essence, and this may happen in a, uh, any artery of the, the body, mm -hmm. you know, it could, and we speak of coronary artery disease when it involves mainly the coronaries, but mm -hmm. this fatty streak or this plaque may involve also the aorta or the cerebral vessel, the renal vessel, causing other problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, when the patient, when the obstruction or the narrowing is not significant, the patient may be completely asymptomatic, may not feel anything. Mm -hmm. uh, that means the supply of blood to the, to the muscle is good mm -hmm. at rest. Mm -hmm. But for any reason that would increase the demand, if let's say the patient becomes anxious, the heart starts speeding up, or he does exercise, mm -hmm. we need, it would require more blood. And that's when symptoms may occur. If the blood supply is not enough, mm -hmm. if, in other words, if there's an imbalance between the supply and the demand, right. then the sim symptoms, symptoms may start. occur. And depending on the severity <clears throat> of the obstruction, mm -hmm. some people we will feel the pain earlier than others. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, and coronary artery disease is also known so under different terminologies. Some people use it back and forth as ischemic heart disease or, or atherosclerotic heart disease, you know. Mm -hmm. so. This is basically what coronary artery disease is. Mm -hmm. Now, based on that um, description, can you go a little bit further and tell us exactly what happens when someone has a heart attack? Well, basically, with the coronary artery disease, it can manifest itself in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some people, like I said before, wouldn't feel anything if they have enough supply to it. Mm -hmm. as, as far as the, the supply is balanced to the demand. Mm -hmm. So they will not feel, they will be completely asymptomatic. And this, and this represents a, a group of people. Now, the major symptoms, the most commonly people will feel what's so-called, quote-unquote, angina, mm -hmm. which is usually a chest discomfort uh, that the patient would describe as a pressure or a vice-like mm -hmm. around the chest. And that would occur predominantly when he does exercise or when he's upset. Mm -hmm. And the pain or the discomfort may go up to his jaw, to his tooth, mm -hmm. or to his arm. And usually it doesn't last more than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And depending on the time, and usually the, the angina will occur again as a result of an imbalance right. of the supply mm -hmm. to the demand. So, and if this pain will last more than 20 minutes, then one has to think of the possibility of a myocardial infarction or quote-unquote heart attack. Right. So usually, uh, to answer your question, a heart attack, uh, I think we have it here on this diagram, this is represented here, is when you, the blood is completely interrupted mm -hmm. for at least 20 minutes. And most of the time is that on the top of the plaque, there will be a, a clot that will be formed and it would obstruct completely the vessel. Mm -hmm. And just to make the analogy as simple as possible is like when you tie a rubber band to your finger mm -hmm. and if you leave it long enough to prevent the blood from circulating your turns finger blue. turns blue. <laughs> right. That's exactly what happens here. Mm -hmm. So if the blood supply is stopped for more than 20 minutes mm -hmm. then you end up having a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Mm -hmm. well, that's okay. another manifestation of coronary heart disease. Uh, coronary artery disease can manifest itself also just as heart failure. Mm -hmm. People get short of breath when they walk or even at night when they're sleeping and develop edema in the, in the lungs. Mm -hmm. That's another way of... The, it's another symptom another of the problem. Sy another right. symptom of the problem, if you, in essence. And the, the fourth and the most dangerous one probably is a sudden death. Right. People would be completely free of symptoms living a normal, normal life. life and suddenly drop dead. Mm -hmm. And that's the most dreadful, most traumatic, uh, right. traumatic uh, event that can occur in a coronary disease. We, one is always scared of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, some people will not have the, the luck to have this warning sign saying that they have angina, or have chest right. pain, or have or develop heart failure. Mm -hmm. It would just, you know, drop dead uh, 
without any warning. Mm -hmm. It seems to happen in, in young people too. It doesn't doesn't have any favorites as far as age or anything is concerned. Well, we uh, we seem to be more concerned when it's a young person, but it right. may occur at any age, right. really, and uh, and also it depends on how much uh, heart damage is and beneath that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you had had a heart attack before, you you probably have more chance of developing sudden cardiac death than somebody that never had a heart attack. Right. If someone has these symptoms, then I think the best advice probably is to tell them to get a hold of their doctor immediately or go to an emergency room so that they can be evaluated. Well, <clears throat> any, uh, any symptoms that would suggest that uh, the pain is coming from the heart should be seriously evaluated. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it's in the doctor's office or in the emergency room, it doesn't uh, really matter. The, what people should understand that they should seek seek help, help, right, and not you to know, be afraid of it. Not to be afraid of it because there's now the the field of uh, cardiology has so much evolved that uh, there are so many things that can be done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the people should really look into it and try to seek help as early as possible and mm -hmm. not wait and try to deny things and make things worse. Sure. What are some of the newer diagnostic measures that uh, can be used now to, to quickly diagnose the problem and, and get someone on the road to recovery? See, basically, uh, well, we, there are all things that were done for more than 20 years now and that's still good and still in practice. And most of the time when somebody presents to the doctor with symptoms that would suggest coronary disease, the history is the key feature. Mm -hmm. The history will decide whether this is typical or atypical of uh, coronary artery disease and go from there. Mm -hmm. So basically the history is a key feature. Mm -hmm. And then go on, the patient is, eval is examined, of course, by the doctor. And then at least a cardiogram is done mm -hmm. and see if there is any abnormalities in the, in the tr uh, on, tracing. On the tracing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, from there, the cardiogram has been here since the beginning Long of the time. century. So it's right. not uh, something new and uh, that's the least you can do and as you w go on to the uh, uh, further evaluation uh, further evaluation mm -hmm. you do more testing and uh, to stick with the basics and a blood test would be ordered to see if there's any significant associated disease like uh, diabetes mm -hmm. hyperlipidemia always one should look for risk factors because the, they it's tell part a lot. of the, the therapy right. you have to modify factors that are reversible. Mm -hmm. So the bl usually a blood test would be done to check the level of uh, cholesterol and triglycerides and also check the blood sugar, check the renal, renal functions and, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So, and then also probably a chest X will be done to uh, have an idea about the size of the heart, mm -hmm. see if there's a big heart or not a big heart and assess the vasculature of the, the lungs if there's no congestion or not. And move on with an echocardiogram. And a lot of things, probably people don't understand what echocardiogram is, is a, a, the transducer that emits sounds and it's reflected and picked up by the transducer again and the image appears on a, on a video screen. Mm -hmm. And now the more we progress in the technology, we moved from what's so-called a single plane echocardiography into a biplane, which shows you a, a real-time motion of the heart contract contractions. Mm -hmm. So what we look in essence, we, we won't be able to s look at the vessels, of course, right. but at least we'll have indirect signs to look at the heart chambers, whether they're dilated or not, mm -hmm. and to look at the contractility of the, of the muscle, mm -hmm. whether there's an abnormality or not, if it's mm -hmm. all synchronous, look at the thickness of the walls and all that. So echocardiograms are very helpful in that setting. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Again, the, the echocardiograms are becoming more sophisticated. There's a Doppler that's uh, mm -hmm. associated to it, and Doppler will just measure the velocity of the blood flow through the heart. Through, through the different the chambers, valves. actually through the through the uh, the valves and through the vessels, mm -hmm. and say if there's an abnormal valve or not, if there's an abnormal uh, leakage of a valve or not, if there's a, a hole between the chambers, etc., mm -hmm. and what what have you. <clears throat> the next, the next thing that um, people hear a lot about is the uh, the balloon procedure, 
And again, I think that goes back to talking about the, the plaque buildup on, on the inside of the arteries. Um, that's done in a cardiac cath lab. Um, maybe that, that's a good point to take off from here and go, go into that procedure a little bit and what's involved and what the recovery is and so forth from that. Before we get to that, uh, <clears throat> I would like to mention that before, usually the, before the sign for the catheterization, there's right. a step previous to that in between that's called a stress test. Okay. Uh, quite often the, the physician will order a stress test mm -hmm. or the cardiologist will order a stress test to test, first of all, uh, it may be diagnostic in mm -hmm. terms of coronary disease, when the, there is uncertainty about the, the clinical situation, mm -hmm. if somebody has uh, presents with atypical symptoms and has risk factors, one should go on and do a stress test to try to figure out if the pain is really reproducible or if there is any changes on the cardiogram during the stress mm -hmm. test or if the blood pressure behaves abnormally during the stress test. So all these things are monitored while the patient is doing a degree of exercise for exactly. a certain period of time. Uh, the stresses can be <clears throat> ordered to test the, the significance of the coronary artery disease. If mm -hmm. we, one is convinced that the patient has angina or has coronary artery disease because of the risk factors and the symptoms that he is he's, uh, experiencing, a stress test will be very helpful mm -hmm. to try to determine the severity of the disease. Mm -hmm. And now again, we're getting into the sophistication. We can throw in, uh, do more sophisticated stress tests with thallium, with isotopes, and take imaging mm -hmm. at, at peak exercise. And then later on, six hours later, uh, we can do uh, exercise with uh, echo uh, cardiograms. Mm -hmm. So we're getting a little bit more sophisticated. And depending on the results of the stress test, will be decided whether the patient should undergo the next step, the next step, which is a cardiac catheterization. Because mm -hmm. there's no way to know how much, although the stress test will indicate how much coronary artery disease one may have, but to pinpoint exactly the lesions, you have to mm -hmm. have an imaging that would show you the vessel itself. And right. the only way to know it right now is to undergo cardiac catheterization. The procedure in itself is, consists of putting a tube through the, one of the arteries, most commonly through the groin mm -hmm. or through the, the arm. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, the catheter is thread to the, the vessel backward into the heart. Mm -hmm. Once it's in the chamber, a dye is injected. Mm -hmm. And again, we look at the, and a picture is taken through a scene, through a movie. Mm -hmm. And we look, when the movie is developed, we look at the contractility of the heart, and we mm -hmm. look also if there's any leakage to the valves or not. Where the and dye it, is going. Yeah. <clears throat> and then once the, uh, that's done, we do what we call coronary arteriography, which mm -hmm. is putting a catheter selectively into the vessel itself and shooting dye there and take pictures in different angles mm -hmm. to have a better view. And then once that's done, the film is reviewed, and usually if the narrowing is severe enough and if it's accessible to angioplasty, mm -hmm. then, or if the doctor decides to do the, the dilatation of the angioplasty, he may choose to do so. Mm -hmm. Or if the patient requires surgery, the same way. This is the, this uh, the, is gold, the, st uh, the gold standard test that be done before that. Right. Or if the, and this will give you enough information to decide whether the patient should undergo surgery or should undergo balloon dilatation, mm -hmm. or if the if you should just go into medical therapy. Right. So to getting back to to the balloon dilatation on itself is just the same way as the catheterization, but this time, at the, once the vessel is localized, the catheter is pushed down to to the vessel mm -hmm. across the the narrowing, mm -hmm. and the balloon is inflated and would dilate the vessel. Mm -hmm. And sort of crush the plaque along the sides. If you Hopefully. Want it, I mean, <laughs> in essence, this is what's happening. Right. And now, uh, of course, uh, it's been now probably about 15 years since the first angioplasty was done in 1977. Mm -hmm. And um, the technique has de developed so much that uh, people have become more and more skillful. It, it gives mm -hmm. another alternative to the patient. Sure. You know. Recovery is, is very quick, and it's what two or three days hospitalization at the most. Yeah, uh, well, although the I mean the uh, 
angioplasty has its problems, you know, mm -hmm. like any invasive procedure has its problems, but still I think it offers the patient an alternative, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, to a bypass surgery, which costs more money and has also its mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, much more extensive. More, it's more extensive. The stay in the hospital is much longer, mm -hmm. and so on. If someone has the, um, <coughs> the balloon procedure performed, how long is that good for before the plaque is apt to stop building up again? Obviously, it's not a cure-all, but it's a, it's a measure that will usually we, Usually what happens is uh, once the, the dilatation is done, there is uh, an approximately, depending on, again on the operator mm -hmm. and, the, and where it's done, a 30% chance of reocclusion. Mm -hmm. which means the vessel will re-occlude re mm -hmm. over a six-month period. Okay. And uh, that's not the problem because you can always do a second dilatation. Right. And that's, again, the results of the second dilatation is probably better than the first one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if, you, if the patient does not have this problem with restenosis within six months, again, he's safe and... Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he can live a decent life. That's good. Good. Um, there are a couple of terms <coughs> that I think sometimes people get confused. Um, can we quickly pass through what the difference between a stroke is and a heart attack? Well, again, this is a, a heart attack, as I, I mentioned before, is the one the, the occlusion or the narrowing of the vessel itself is of the coronary artery is complete and causes damage, mm -hmm. head damage, mm -hmm. as opposed to a stroke, which involves the cerebral circulation. Mm -hmm. All right? So a stroke is, in essence, uh, could be related to, again, a complete occlusion of a vessel mm -hmm. in the brain, mm -hmm. whether it's due to a plaque that breaks a small bit of cholesterol and sends it to the distal part of the, mm -hmm. of the vessel, or it's coming from the heart. Or the stroke may be due also to a hemorrhage right. or bleeding into the brain. Mm -hmm. That may cause a br also a, mm -hmm. a stroke. So, and again, a stroke can be also due to a heart attack. Sometimes when you, a patient has a heart attack, the, if we can see it here, <coughs> whether if it involves a distal part of the, what you call the apex of the heart, mm -hmm. like a, a pocket will form right. and a blood clot will lodge inside. And not infrequently, a small piece of that blood clot may dislodge mm -hmm. and go into the brain mm -hmm. and cause damage. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, it's two different things. Right. Although a stroke may be due to a heart problem. Similar symptoms coming on and, yeah. and two different organs are affected. Um, the terminology for the for the blood clot that may that may cause that uh, again there's two of them one's an embolus and one's a thrombus and I think sometimes there's confusion on on the difference of the two maybe we should touch on that for just a minute. Well, uh, an embolism is when a small piece of material migrates, mm -hmm. travels, travels, and right. whether it's coming from the heart or from a vessel. Mm -hmm. and it occludes a, another vessel and causes damage, whether it's in the brain or in the lung. Mm -hmm. Whereas thrombosis is when a blood clot is formed in, like in a dilated area, like a, in a sac in the ventricle, an aneurysm, for example, mm -hmm. into the ventricle, or an aneurysm into the aorta, or even in the varicose veins. Mm -hmm. So it pretty much stays stationary inside it? Uh, it may break loose. Right. But uh, in essence, this is what, what it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are different phases of treating um, patients who have had heart attacks. Um, we've pretty much de described what happens to the patient during the acute phase. Um, once they're admitted to a hospital, they would obviously go into intensive care unit and have some of the, the, um, the basic um, evaluation tests that we've talked about. Um, what happens after that? What's the next phase? Well, once the, if the, the patient quite often it is the case, it will survive the heart attack. Mm -hmm. and, and then it goes into what we, one calls the secondary prevention. First, uh, he's sent home and he has to rest mm -hmm. with gradual increase in the amount of exercise. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it starts by moving at home and then progressively every week mm -hmm. increase it. Now, uh, it depends on, again, uh, on the physician. Some people would like to get a stress test before the, they get out of the hospital, mm -hmm. what's called an early uh, pre-discharge stress test, which is uh, not a full stress test, but it's a modified stress test where we have the patient exercise a little bit of, a little amount. Mm -hmm. And again, go over through the blood pressure, the heart rate, and the EKG during that stress test and see if there is any symptoms that would develop or if there's something abnormal mm -hmm. occur on the cardiogram. If that is the case, the patient will not be discharged and quite often it would undergo the catheterization before going home okay. and decide on the therapy according to the results of the, right. of the catheterization. If the patient, on the other hand, does well on the stress test, on the modified stress test, he's sent home on medication, whatever the, the physician chooses to, do, to use at that time and followed up closely and repeat stress tests will be done in six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Then it will be a full stress test. And again, the patient, depending on the result of the stress test, the, the physician may decide whether the patient should undergo catheterization or, or not. Or what he's, what he's able to do yeah. once he does get home. But uh, <clears throat> quite often, if the stress test is good, mm -hmm. at that time if the patient does not develop any signs of ischemia, what is usually recommended is a rehabilitation program where the patient joins a rehabilitation program which has three phases. Mm -hmm. uh, the first phase is probably done in the hospital and the two others in the community. And again, the basic principle is to increase progressively the amount of exercise and get the patient into a physical fitness. Or, I mean, physical fitness, mainly cardiovascular fitness. Mm -hmm. Because now there is enough evidence that endurance in general of uh, physical fitness in, does good to the heart. Mm -hmm. And again, one thing that one should stress to the patient is his, uh, his education. I mean, he has to change his lifestyle. I mean, if he's a smoker, he should stop smoking. If he has high cholesterol, he should do something about it, uh, go on a diet to try to decrease his cholesterol, mm -hmm. and eventually take medication if that doesn't work. If he has hypertension, he should be controlled. If he has diabetes, he should be controlled, uh, and mm -hmm. so on. So it's a whole... We it's a whole program, program that needs to be incorporated yeah. and address each phase as it, as exactly. it uh, affects that patient. <clears throat> Let's get back to the fun factor, cholesterol, diet, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we hear a lot about cholesterol. You see labels on packages now, no cholesterol and so forth. Um, let's talk a little bit about what kind of a diet people should be thinking about, um, ways that they can modify their lifestyle to improve their, their cardiac outlook. Mm -hmm. Well, there are different reasons why, sh why one should go on diet, you know, whether the patient is diabetic, whether the patient is hypertensive, whether he has hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol, or whether he is obese. Because, mm -hmm. in other words, each person may have a different objective in, in, right. in his diet. In general, if the patient is Obese is overweight. What we, uh, what we call obesity is when the, the weight is 20% above the normal value for that for person. That size. For that size. Mm -hmm. uh, then the amount of calories has to be restricted. The only way to lose weight is to reduce the amount of calories. And mm -hmm. the quickest way to lose weight is to re reduce not only the calories but the amount of fat in the diet. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, now, the, for the rest, pretty much the American Heart Association as well as the American Diabetic Association have set some gold standard. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody or most of the people agree that a normal diet, regardless of the amount of calories, should include about 50 to 60 percent of carbohydrate, mm -hmm. preferably complex carbohydrate. Not more than 40, 30 to 35 percent of fat in the mm -hmm. diet. I'll go back to the fat issue in a minute. And not m probably the protein should be about 15 percent. The cholesterol in the diet should be less than 300 milligrams per day. Per day. Right. And again, the average American diet, to give you an example, t runs around 800 milligrams, which is two and a half times what, what it should be. It should be. So no wonder why a lot of people mm -hmm. have high cholesterol. Uh, that's one thing. Now, regarding the fat, again, 
there are different types of fat. Uh, that is so-called the cholesterol. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, polyunsaturated fat, the monounsaturated fat, and the saturated fat. Right. Again, the American Heart Association, American Diabetic Association have set standards, like the uh, the saturated fat should not be more than seven percent. What we call saturated fat is like a coconut oil, uh, all the fat coming from animals, right. and butter, the natural. Uh, cheeses and all that. Mm -hmm. So that should not be more than 7% in the diet. Now, the rest of it, which is between 23 to 28%, mm -hmm. should be implemented in fat. What, what is the alternative that we offer the people? Right. It's either polysaturated fat or monosaturated fat. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, again, people are talking about is to try to limit the polysaturated fat to 10% or less. Okay. And the rest, the monosaturated fat is the, the rest. And, mm -hmm. and among the monosaturated fat, one should include probably olive oil, which also has its values. Mm -hmm. Now, getting back to the, what you see in the supermarket in general as uh, no cholesterol, and one has to be very careful about reading that. Right. To look because, for the fat content as well. Yeah, because you may see no cholesterol in the diet, but if you look at the composition of the fat in that, you'll find predominantly saturated right fat. Yeah. So you, you have to be very careful with that. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason we limit also the carbohydrate, because uh, when you eat a lot of carbohydrate, you, you have a tendency to increase the triglycerides. Mm -hmm. So with a good diet, I mean, by what we, we can recommend people uh, as far as the cholesterol to try to lower that is try to avoid anything, decrease the amount of cholesterol in the diet. I mean, try to bring it down to preferably around 200 milligrams a day mm -hmm. or <clears throat> and try to change the 35 percent of, uh, of fat okay. included in the diet in majority being monosaturated or polyunsaturated, I'm sorry, monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fat. Mm -hmm. And that would include a lot of uh, vegetables. I mean, uh, eat green. Which ones are good ones? <laughs> eat green. I mean, as far as vegetables, the only one that one should avoid probably is uh, the olives and the avocado because of the high calorie content, and, and olives have a lot of salt in it. But as far as fat, they have very limited amount. Mm -hmm. So as far as vegetables, really there's no limit to it and uh, preferably you should steam them mm -hmm. instead of... Uh, Have nice fresh vegetables rather than canned or That's right. Whatever. And uh, avoid absolutely canned vegetable, right. processed vegetable, because they're very rich in, in sodium. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have the choice, pre preferably use frozen vegetables than canned vegetables. Mm -hmm. and so try it goes to fresh, then frozen, then canned yeah. on the bottom. Yeah. Right. And poultry? Preferable over red meat? Uh, as far fish. as the meat now, uh, also uh, the, uh, the fat meat, and if you, if you have to choose, probably use poultry, but, uh, poultry limited to turkey and chicken, mm -hmm. because duck also and goose are a very, very large amount of uh, fat right. in it. So poultry, and you should avoid, you should skin them, uh, remove the skin mm -hmm. when you cook them, mm -hmm. and avoid deep frying them and try to broil it or broil or bake it. Or bake it. That's mm -hmm. much better. And also fish is good mm -hmm. if you keep away from uh, prepared the same way. <laughs> exactly. And right. although there's a little bit of controversy about shellfish and shrimp and particular and lobster that are very rich in cholesterol. All the good ones. <laughs> yeah. But still fish remains a uh, and it's been proven in studies. I mean, people that have uh, at least twice a week fish have less incidence of coron or cardiac event in, in, in the follow-up. So it's been done by the Finnish people, I believe, in mm -hmm. the Helsinki Heart Study. Mm -hmm. So if you incorporate fish at least one, uh, twice a week... And then your poultry uh, the rest of the time. Yeah, poultry. And try to... Now, of course, when you go to the supermarket, you've got all different uh, kinds of red meat, you know. Mm -hmm. Try to... Stick to the leanest one that you can have. 
and Remove avoid, the fat ahead of time before yeah, you cook it. And, and try to avoid, you know, like uh, hot dogs and uh, frankfurters and all. these are very rich in fat. Mm -hmm. Lots of preservatives yeah. too. Yeah. And if you want to use hamburgers, it, it is preferable to use, uh, for example, ground uh, turkey rather than ground than beef. Because virtually has no fat in it. Good point. And as far as the uh, <clears throat> dairy products, if you can avoid anything that, uh, particularly milk, try to get skim milk or at least 1% fat milk. Mm -hmm. It's better than the, the regular milk. And try to, any cheese or dairy product like yogurt and cottage cheese, try to avoid getting the regular one, try to get the low fat one. Ice cream. Uh, <laughs> same thing for Goes ice without cream. saying, yeah. huh? As far as the fruit are uh, concerned, since we're talking about diet, fruits in general are very good, mm -hmm. you know, except for coconut. Okay. But, I mean, like apple, one apple a day is, uh, keeps the doctor Keeps the doctor away, away right? <laughs> uh, wasn't wrong, we, did it. we said it. That's right. Yeah. Um, there's lots of new medications um, on the market. You have the Mevacor and Questrin and so forth. Uh, <coughs> have they proven to be helpful in, in many cases, or are they a limited use? Or how would you... Well, in general, uh, when it gets to lowering cholesterol triglycerides, is the, the main thing is diet. Mm -hmm. Try to emphasize as much as you can for the diet because all the other medications have side effects right. in general. And a lot of times we run into problems with patients not tolerating the medicine. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this uh, levostatin or what, what is it called? Uh, the new drug on the market for the treatment of uh, high cholesterol right. seems to be very good. Mm -hmm. It decreases the LDL and total cholesterol and uh, with some raise in HDL cholesterol in most of the cases, but it has, still has side effects. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, problems is the, the muscle or so-called myositis that the patient or myopathy that the patient may develop from it. Okay. And a lot of patients will complain of muscle pain and uh, weakness. Mm -hmm. And then the good thing is it is reversible. In, in other words, if you stop the medicine, everything... The symptoms will subside. Yeah. And it seems that uh, <clears throat> also that this myopathy or myositis occurs m more frequently when it is associated with another hypolipemic agent called uh, probucol. Mm -hmm. So one has to be very careful in mixing the different medication. I think that's, that's one of the confusing things. Um, individuals, especially older people, will go to a couple of different doctors and they'll be prescribed different medications and pretty soon they're taking so many that they work against each other and, and mm -hmm. they're really not getting good therapy from anyone. So I think that's a, it's a valid point for people to, to think about is you know, take the appropriate medication and, and try not to mix the, mix the picture too much. Yeah. And I think I encourage people to read about it, about right. the medication. And what I usually tell p patients is try to exercise and eat a healthy diet, you know, as much as you can. And leave the medication as a last resort. As a last resort. resort right. You know, because it has side effects. And it, it is easy to, to prescribe. It takes 15 seconds to write a prescription. Right. But it may take you about a couple of hours to try to convince a patient to go on the right diet. Mm -hmm. You know, it may mm -hmm. take a lot of time. So it takes a lot of energy, so uh, this is why the tendency is probably to give them just a prescription. Sure. It takes a lot of determination to, to set a goal and work towards it as far as losing weight is concerned. And you made a, you made a very interesting comment the other day that if you, you have 50 pounds to lose and you lose only a percentage of it, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, you're still way ahead of the game yeah. than when you started. Well, when you, particularly in obesity, when you look uh, in a general... An average person, you need about, let's say, 30 to 35 kilocalories per kilo mm -hmm. per day, which is about 16 kilocalories per pound per day. Right. For, this is just to maintain your, your, weight. your weight and your daily activities that you do in the office or whatever. I mean, we're not talking about strenuous exercise, just the daily activity. Mm -hmm. If you want just a sedentary life, probably a little bit less, five less cal calories. Mm -hmm. And if you take somebody who weighs, uh, let's say, 120 kilos, which is close to 250 uh, pounds. pounds, a patient like that will require, if you, if you compute that, uh, 120 by 35, that's uh, 3,500 plus uh, 
700 is 4,200 kilocalories, I believe, mm -hmm. if, my, if my calculations Close are right. Close enough, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this is more than the average. Right. So if that patient just take an average regular diet, he will lose... He'll automatically lose weight. Automatically lose weight. Right. So this is what I, I tell patients, you know. Uh, if you obese and if you have a weight that's way above the average, probably you don't have to be very stringent in your diet, right. you know, you will lose weight. Just watch your calories and I mean, keep and, at it. And one thing that we don't emphasize, unfortunately, is the behavioral modification. Because quite often the patient, will, he's willing, he will lose weight, mm -hmm. but uh, once he lost, he reached the goal, and then again. It's a problem keeping it off. Yeah. Right. Um, smoking. Uh, smoking is a no-no. That's a no-no, right? Uh, Lots of new things out, gum and patches and everything else. Yeah, we we just want to open a parenthesis about that uh, with the release recently of the people that had heart attacks because they were smoking while they were wearing the patch. Right. So I think one has to make a commitment. Right. Choose one Desire of Desire has to be there. One of them. You can't have both. Right. You know? Right. And, and I think this may also apply to the chewing nicorette, mm -hmm. and although there's no data about it, but still, I think... So it's a concern. It's a concern. And I know it is hard to stop smoking, but... So far, you know, we've had pretty good luck with the patches, though. Yeah. People seem to do well. I mean, in general, it works. Well. I mean, people do well, but right. again, the same problem about the diet. Once they, they stop smoking, how long will they stay like this? Right. And again, this is the... It's just like drugs, you know, when they offer you a cigarette, you should say no. That's right. The, it's always the first one that would start like the, the habit. commercial that says, I bet you can't eat just one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if you teach a patient to say no, even for the first cigarette, the chances are very high that they may stay. Right. And it takes a real commitment. And I think if a husband and wife um, both smoke and one decides to quit, it's very difficult when the other one continues, if they can do it mm -hmm. together then they can be a support mechanism for each other and, and yeah. break the habit together. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good incentive. Uh, in closing, I have one last question. Uh, what's your opinion about an aspirin a day? Well, there's been a lot of uh, talk about it. And uh, although the, it's clear when people have um, had a heart attack or presented with what's so-called unstable angina or had a stroke, there's mm -hmm. no doubt that uh, one aspirin a day prevents further apparition of other mm -hmm. cardiac or cerebrovascular uh, event. Right. But now to give it to everybody as a primary prevention, it's a little bit uh, difficult. The, uh, the study done by, I think, by the physician study group where they had 22,000 physicians take aspirin 325 milligrams every other day mm -hmm. showed an overall decrease incidence of cardiovascular event by 44 percent. It's very encouraging. It is very encouraging. It's a large number to study too. Yeah, but unfortunately uh, when this statistical significance was only valid for people that were above 50, the age of 50. Okay. And also the drawback on that is the a lot of patients that were taking a lot of people, I should say patient, people, not patients because they were not sick, these guys, they, they had a lot of incidence of strokes, whether mm -hmm. hemorrhagic or thrombotic, mm -hmm. one way, which was the same as placebo, but still it was worrying. And also there's a high incidence of GI bleed, like melanoma, mm -hmm. which is worrisome also. Right. So we cannot just say to people, take one aspirin a day, you'll be safe. I mean, it one, works well in a lot of people, but you've got to be sure you have no other yeah. predisposing factors. And you have to weigh the pros and cons. Right. Like I said before, when you, the patient had a heart attack or, or if he had a stroke, I mean, it's justified to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you take a person that has no symptoms at all, mm -hmm. and to prevent eventual cardiac or cerebrovascular event and give him aspirin and turn out to have a massive GI bleed or stroke. It, You've defeated your purpose. It is very difficult to, right. to accept. To justify. Yeah. Right. Very good. Well, once again, I thank you very much for being our guest, and I hope you'll come back and, and join us again. Um,
It's been very enlightening and, and, and educational as well as enjoyable. Until uh, our next Health Point program, uh, this is Davina Schmidt, your host, uh, wishing you a very safe weekend and stay out of the sun and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.